levels of trust in democratic institutions. And we, we devolve that trust through voting and um, we elect our, our principles to make decisions on our behalf. And to the extent that we have trust in our democracy and trust that decisions are made in the public interest, we have a well-functioning liberal democracy. Allied to that, of course, is the notion of legitimacy, that decisions are legitimate to the extent that they are made transparently, fairly, in accordance with the rule of law, and, they, and even where they do not necessarily accord with my interests, we can see, because they're made in a fair and transparent manner, that they are thereby legitimate. Now, liberal democracies require, require both of these as their lifeblood, and uh, alongside the rule of law. We require our, 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 the, these qualities to be pronounced and for us to have a, a great deal of visibility of those qualities. Um, even if they aren't rendered immediately tangible, we all have a sense of what trust in government is and what the legitimacy of government decision-making is. Now, I'm going to move fast today because some of the presentations earlier were very speedy, so 10 minutes goes very quite, quite fast, doesn't it? Now, the problems that we are encountering globally and in liberal democracies particularly um, uh, are those of the participatory democratic systems where... You know, we all instinctively understand what participation in democracy means by voting, through elections, through writing, um, uh, through signing petitions, through protests. You know, the, 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 the inputs that we ourselves believe are our rightful, um, our rightful qualities of our democratic expression. This is a participatory democracy is one in which um, the public feel. Uh, an output of participation in democracy is that tolerance and reciprocity are increased. There's a greater public understanding of their own interests through debates, through, through the media, through social media now. And then uh, democratic theorists such as John Dreisek, who look at deliberative democracy, you know, they reinforce this notion that the more we deliberate, the more we talk and discuss and have you know, open debates around our political interests, the better our trust and better the legitimacy of decision-making in government, or our sense of legitimacy in decision-making in government. But against this, we, we counterbalance trends that are rather concerning. So we know that there are declining levels globally in liberal democracies um, in political participation, especially political, political participation in those orthodox uh, processes, especially amongst young people. We also know that there are declining levels of trust in governments and especially in democratic institutions. And what's also um, a commensurate rise in what's been called political hobbyism is on the rise, where people tend to hold on to entrenched political views as if they are supporting a particular football team and supporting it for its own sake rather than the, the sake of the principles at, at hand. And this all adds up to an ongoing legitimacy problem that in the public in the, in, especially in, in public debate, it's becoming less clear uh, about who people are, the provenance of ideas, what interests they represent, whether we can trust one another to argue and debate in good faith. These are, 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 are issues that are essentially um, ascribed to uh, the digital social realms where, where we... You know, in, Plenty of astroturfing and bots becoming increasingly prevalent and sophisticated in interrupting uh, political debates, or interjecting in political debates, rather. Globally, we see, um, against all of this, polarisation. Now, the work of Thomas Crothers and Andrew, I don't know who you, catalogues the... the, the states across the world which are experiencing or have been experiencing increasing polarisation. Now, political polarisation is, is something that we've, we've tracked for some time, of course, but understanding what polarisation in democracies does is important. We know that, that it weakens respect, tends to weaken respect for democratic norms, tends to corrode the basic legislative processes, whereby, for example, judges are called the enemy of the state, undermines those judges' non-partisan stature, and tends to fuel public disaffection with, with political parties. That's a general trend, and we can look to the UK, to the US, Australia, and other states as examples where increasingly the, the, the binary choices that people have are becoming further and further apart, and there's less, um, in, seems to be less overlap on the centre ground and centre issues. And Australia, as I mentioned, is no stranger to this. Um, a report by Macquarie University 
um, found that, that increasingly polarisation in Australia is, is, is being driven by narratives that challenge the fundamentals of a pluralist liberal democracy through exclusivist appeals to race, to ethnicity, to nation and to gender. And these are real discourses pushing particular forms of politics to behave in particular sorts of ways. Now, one of those ways, which I won't bundle up with the whole of the right wing of politics, which I think is very unfair usually, um, one of those ways is the far right and the, the rise of far right, um, or the, 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 the increase of far right cases according to ASIO, that's the uh, UK, um, Australia's domestic intelligence service, who found that up to 40% of their counterterrorism cases now involve far right violence extremism. And this is a priority for them. For ASIO, they see young, especially young white males, especially post-pandemic, who've, who've, during periods of lockdown, have gravitated towards uh, the use of internet and particular websites, or tech websites, where they witness or come across and buy into certain narratives around, around what it is to be Australian, what it is to be... Um, or what it is to be Australian, what it is not to be Australian, and whether or not uh, white Australia is becoming marginalised. These are narratives, of course. Oh, I need to kind of keep switching between my two sets of slides here. Now, alt tech, as many of you will, will know, are, are, are those sites where, where those who feel they are either marginalised or excluded by mainstream narratives go to, to or gravitate towards to find like-minded people. It's what's been called the infrastructure for the far right. It's an environment in which ideological engagement for the like-minded is self-reinforcing. And we're all familiar, of course, with, with social media bubbles where we opt into networks and opt into relationships with people on, in online spaces which, which reflect our own pre-existing beliefs. Of course, in those bubbles, our beliefs are reinforced and alt-tech um, platforms are no different. You know, Telegram channels and Gab, 4chan, 4chan especially, given the news from Buffalo, are all representative or elements of this alt-tech rise. Now, there's a methodological question of whether or not, or the extent to which the numbers are of Australians in those channels are, are on the rise or on the decrease. As we all know, it's difficult to find someone's nationality in those online anonymous spaces. Nonetheless, analysis that we've, um, we've undertaken, that my research partner has undertaken, shows increasing elements of Australia-specific narratives, Australia-specific political narratives, from which we might derive an understanding of, of the trends in those, in, those, um, in those platforms. We do see them networked, heavily networked, between English-speaking countries, notably the UK, notably the US. We see, as I just mentioned, a, a rise or a particular thread of Australia-specific discourses, particularly around um, the myths of the ANZACs, that's the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, which is very heavily influenced and influential in Australia's national identity anyway. And then finally, we see an increased emphasis on, on online, offline interaction. And as mentioned in the previous panel, the, that, that, that these are not just online spaces, but these are online spaces which call for action in the offline, or in the real world, in various ways. So to take an example of that, um, we looked at the, the, the connection between the far right, far right movements and, and COVID-19, or the anti-vaxxer uh, rallies in Australia. So in the past six to eight months, there are a whole series of these rallies people coming out onto the streets with, and marching through, through the major capital cities, largely demonstrating a whole range of different um, political viewpoints connected to, but not orchestrated necessarily by one group in the far right. Now, just because I know I'm going to go over time. You haven't nudged me yet. You're good. You're good. Keep going. Are you sure? <laughs> I did say, big nudge if I'm going. We have a if I start to see glazed eyes, big, big nudge. So what are we starting to see in these spaces from these rallies? Well, we do, we, we've undertaken an uh, uh, analysis, we, essentially a, a lot of imagery that we, we've sucked in from the uh, photographs of these rallies, and we're looking across these at the sort of narratives that are depicted on billboards, on signs and flags and what have you. So just to quickly traverse those for you, we're seeing um, a, a clear link between the, the narratives that we see in particularly in US politics seeping into, 
into Australian politics. So a large number of, of, of Trump supporting flags, a lot of um, very uh, far right liberalist uh, don't tread on me flag imageries, and also the use of the Australian merchant navy flag, which was, is a way of, of circumventing or, or suggesting an alternate loyalty that is national but not to the government. So symbolism is heavy in these areas, in these protests. We see them reflected in the online spaces, in the offline, in the real world protests. There's an orchestration as well of a whole range of grievances that are variously declaiming, and well, then, largely declaiming the, the authority of the government to, to, to force people to take vaccinations, to wear masks, and all the health measures necessary in the pandemic. But a whole range of alternate grievances around, around multiculturalism, around gay rights, anti-gay rights, an airing, a heavy airing of a whole range of conspiracy theories, all adding up to this suspicion about government authority and experts in general. One of which, prominently, the Great Replacement Theory, again, which was um, underlined as import the importance of which was underlined in the Buffalo shootings just last week. Now, we also see, a, again, borrowing from the, the US potentially, is this make Australia great again sentiment, the wearing of red caps, you know, the, the nostalgic retrospection of a past that we have lost, a pure past where Australia wasn't multicultural. Of course, it always was, but when it wasn't in their eyes multicultural, when there was a nuclear family, where, where things like gay or trans rights weren't on the agenda. A past which was, in their eyes, pure and one that, and, and one that we should return to um, forthwith. On the whole, they are, they are joined by a sentiment that they are, are pro-democracy, but anti-government. They, they look to um, their own authority as true Australian patriots and reject the authority of the government, which is important and common across many of these movements globally. So to bring this to a conclusion before you nudge me, um, oh, crumbs, there we go. Um, how do we kind of bring this into an understanding of what this means for liberal democracy? Now, this is a deliberately complex diagram, so you won't look at it too carefully. It's how academics roll. Make it complex, and you won't really inquire too much about, or interrogate it too much. But if you do, do it afterwards when no one can hear. So I've got, um, what I depict here are what I think two trends that, that feed into, are eventually corrosive towards liberal democracy. On the, on above, I, uh, I depict what I call acute opportunist short-term trends of disinformation, interruption in, in normal or the orthodox democratic processes or interfering with those processes, casting doubt on the outcomes of elections to say you know, the, 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 the vote was... Uh, was miscounted or that it was corrupted somehow, or, or, or increasingly being vocal on issues of national emergencies, such as public health protests against, anti against masks, against vaccines, and so on. These are acute short-term trends which erode the legitimacy, I argue, of government, erode the, the legitimacy of government decision-making in our interests. That's in the acute and the short term. But I think there's also, allied to that, a chronic long-term set of trends that has eroded trust in governments over years, if not decades, in which the polarisation of our politics in, in Australia, as we've seen perhaps elsewhere, is, has been ongoing and driven by rising forms of overt and covert racism, rising forms of intolerance, and pushing towards a, a partisan form of politics. I feel that my argument, that I would go on in a, in a longer paper, would be that a, an erosion of trust feeds into uh, a commensurate eroding of the values of, um, of, of you know, the, 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 sorry, the, the values of the rule of law, pluralism and inclusivity are all undermined by, I think, three countering trends, that of populism, that of polarisation and that of intolerance. So to bring to a conclusion... Uh, our, our work, which is by no means concluded but is moving on, is showing that we think the power of narrative and discourse are central to the quality of contemporary participatory democracies and even more so in a digital age because the rapid digitisation has induced, I think uncontroversially for us here, a series of, of vulnerabilities in our democracies and especially seen this is framed within the, the problems of polarisation and the shift towards far-right politics plays into those vulnerabilities.
We don't yet know what the consequences will be in the long term, but we do know, and we do suspect, sorry, that liberal democracy, the central axioms of liberal democracy and our participatory democracy are at risk. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> sorry. Thank you for that, Tim. That was quite emotional. I know, I'm crying a little bit. <laughs> was it that good or that bad? It was that good. <laughs> um, so we're going to do a Q&A with Tim right here until we get everything situated. So if everyone has any questions right now, we can get to them. I'm not carrying this panel for an hour, so... Oh, we have some, we have some questions. Uh, that the, the crowd might like to hear your thoughts on how the results of the election will affect these alt-right movements um, and what trends you anticipate uh, both in the lead-up to the election and afterwards. Okay. Um, so that's a really difficult question. Thanks for the first, for, as an opener. Um, so well, the first thing to say is that we know that the that alt-right, in, on, in, online, alt, in online spaces, the, the narratives are generally to reject mainstream politics. So they don't buy into mainstream politics. They see both parties as illegitimate representatives of Australian interests. So to the extent that, there's, that the, the election is happening, they are perhaps gravitating towards the far right of politics. So there's a, what's called the, the, um, uh, there's a individual called Clive Palmer who's, um, who's running a campaign, the United Australian... UAP, I can't remember the acronym, but um, he's a, uh, running on a, far, on, a, on a further to the right platform and as an outside candidate. So think Nigel Farage, but in Australia and, and a lot bigger. And so he's, he would be somebody who, who, who would attract that sort of, of, of support from the far right, but I don't think they would necessarily see him as, as a figurehead because you know, he still buys into the system. Um, also, for those of you who don't know, the Australian general election or federal election is happening this Saturday. Um, and if you haven't voted already, then remember it's compulsory. You get fined if you don't. Um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of talk in those spaces about not buying in and spoiling your ballot. So it's what's called a donkey vote. So they, um, for, for a, a, a means of protesting, well, for many who see themselves as rejecting the mainstream of, of political participation, to avoid a fine and yet having to vote, you can still spoil your ballot. And that is seen as, well, write a message is often said. You, know, you can write a message and declaiming um, the, the validity of the election. That's one narrative that, that you see. Um, so to the extent that they, uh, this is about orthodox politics, they, they don't buy into the orthodoxy. And yet you know, they use part of it to reject those, those, um, the voting process, for example, and say, well, this is all fixed. And we've seen that in Australia, actually, recently. The certain marginal narratives starting to question whether or not the, the, you know, whether the, the count is going to be fair. You know, and that's a direct import from the US elections, of course. Um, how that's going to play out in long term, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's difficult to see, in terms of the numbers of, you know, the sheer quantity of people participating in those platforms, we, we don't know what the numbers are. ASIO say that their, their caseload is increasing. So we can take it as um, on, on their word that, yes, this is a problem that is increasing. But in terms of the absolute numbers, we don't know. So the trends are going to be perhaps um, unclear. So. Right, thank you. Have That's you got really an easier question than anybody else <laughs> to start with? Thank you. There's a question right behind you. Sorry, I don't know if it's going to be easier, but it's a question. Um, how, or do you think, and if so, how, do you think that these sort of trends and the sort of alt-right culture in Australia is influenced by the mandatory participation? Because I think mm. in, in the U.S., there's obviously the far right is sort of aligned with Trumpism, but there's still a need for the Republican Party to get people to go out and vote. Yeah. And since in Australia that's mandatory, you don't sort of need to encourage that into the far right to... to get them to vote, so does that change how sort of the radicalization 
goes? Well, it, it, it certainly plays into the general... Oh, thank you. That's a much better question for me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly plays into the, the wider narrative in those, amongst those groups that government is, interferes unduly in your life. So, so the, the mandates for masks, the mandates for vac vaccinations are two examples of the government's overreach on their view that government has no right to interfere and force you to do something that you don't want to do. And the mandate to vote is an extension of that argument. That you know, this is another example of the government you know, interfering in our lives and, you know, and pushing us to do something that we shouldn't, uh, that, we, that we do not, that we believe we have a natural right not to do. So to that extent, yeah, that feeds into a, an ongoing sentiment. What was the second part of your question? It was... It does it, and if so, how? That was the okay. whole question. Um, well, that, that, that I, get, I went yeah. as easy as I could. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. I'll buy you a drink for that, thank you so much. One <laughs> yes. of the free cocktails later, afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beatrice from the University of Manchester, slash King's College. And my question is, when you talk about the crisis of legitimacy in official institutions, mm. um, in addition to having groups and social movements challenging this legitimacy, mm. we also have individuals using the internet to set up their own supposedly think tanks, yeah. institutions. Have you noticed this trend also in Australia? How does it work there? Um, I don't, I don't know about setting up their own think tanks, um, but certainly I mean, the pandemic gave us some really good examples that there are a whole range of individuals who set up their own, um, their own websites selling different versions of expertise. I mean, we saw it here in the UK, we saw it in, Austra in, in the US, but we certainly saw it in, the, in, in Australia. And they said, look, we, we do not believe the expertise of the government. The government are not to be trusted because they have a vested interest. They're in the pockets of pharmaceutical companies or... They, were, they had a hand in, in promulgating the pandemic and so on. And they used that, 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 that seeding of distrust in government to then draw attention to their supposed expertise. And, um, and one was a popular celebrity, a TV chef, who said, you know, if, you, if you buy my products, if you come in, buy into my, um, my ideas about alternate ways of, of protecting yourself from the pandemic, then, then you know, you'll be better off. Now, that's the, a substantive example. Certainly, that, that, that idea, that notional um, you know, the selling of a particular version of what expertise is, is endemic to most liberal democracies where you know, open discourse you know, is, is, is encouraged. It's certainly there in Australia. And we'll see, not, I mean, that's one example, there'll be several others in the pandemic. And this goes to the general trend that expertise is, is on the... Oh, a trust in expertise is on the decline. Um, and in the UK, it's, the, the narratives during, for example, Brexit were very pronounced. You know, we're, we're sick of experts. You know, and that was from a government minister. So I think there's, there's a general demise in expertise and this questioning of what is authority. Alternate sources of authority can be trusted, they say. And in doing so, that, that reduces any sort of, well, not any sort, but overall suppresses the legitimacy that we can have in decision-making processes if we do not believe that government has sufficient expertise or sufficient knowledge to act in our interests. So yeah, it's a big, it's a big problem. Is, is it on the increase? I, I don't know. So next we are going to shift to Evian. Dr. Evian is a research fellow in current emerging threats at the International Center for Counterterrorism in Hog, Netherlands. Her research focuses on the far right gender and online radicalization, recruitment and propaganda as well as online governance and regulation across India, North America, and Europe. She is an affiliate at the Center for Research on Extremism at the University of Oslo, where she completed her PhD. Evian was a Vox Poll censored, sponsored visiting researcher at the Oxford Internet Institute and a visiting scholar at the New York University. She has given talks and consults for policymakers and inter intelligence agencies, such as the US State Department, European Commission, Council of Europe, NATO, and tech companies. And here goes, are we good? And here hopefully goes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, and can you see my slides on the screen? 
Yes, you're good to go. We can see you. Great. So I can't see anybody in the room, but I will try my best just to go through the slides and hopefully it will be okay. Um, so first, I wish I could have attended in person, but I'm recovering from COVID, so I thought it best not to travel and, and attend in person, but uh, I really wish I could have been there today. Um, so even though this panel is focused on trends of alt tech platforms, today I really want to focus my talk looking at cross-platform activity between mainstream and alt tech platforms, and what are the implications when it comes to looking at blind spots within this relationship. Okay, next slide, please. Does the slide say mainstream versus alt tech? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so as an overview, uh, when we think about the rise of the internet and its use by far right actors, and I should caveat by saying my research focus is on the far right, not on other forms of extremism like jihadism, for instance, we saw the shift from web 1.0, that is websites, chat rooms, and forums, to what we commonly know as the internet today, web 2.0, namely social media, user-generated content, and the visual turn. And we often attribute web 2.0 to mainstream platforms like Facebook or Meta today, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit, which grew in the 2010s. But also with Web 2.0, we saw the rise of fringe platforms that, is non, that are both non-ideological and ideological in terms of their purpose and creation. And within the category of fringe platforms, this is where I would place alt tech platforms. And these can be characterized um, Hi, can by... Oh, sorry, I think I got cut off there. Shall I continue? Yeah, we can still hear you. Right, thanks. Um, I think I'm just hearing the other speaker <laughs> in, on my end. Um, so all tech platforms, the first would be platforms created for extremists and used by extremists. And there's a plethora of various platforms within this category, many of which we here are familiar with. And I think one aspect to bear in mind is that these platforms are always coming and going. Um, and that makes a difference in terms of how then we start to understand um, their utilization by far right actors. The second category of alt tech platforms, I would call tech or call platforms that are ultra libertarian. That is, they have a laissez faire approach in terms of what content is allowed on their platforms. And this is commonly the Chan sphere, uh, like 4chan and HKUN, previously 8chan, uh, as well as streaming sites such as Odyssey and DLive, which run on blockchain technology. And then finally, within the category of alt tech platforms, I would include platforms that have been hijacked by extremists to serve purposes. Uh, most notably gaming platforms like Discord and Twitch, Twitch obviously um, being relevant with the Buffalo shooting, as well as messaging platforms like Telegram. Next slide, please. So in terms of then understanding how do far right actors use mainstream and alt tech platforms, one prominent way to think about their activity is that of swarms. That is, swarms can be considered decentralized structures. While we might have central nodes within these networks, often the user base is quite fragmented and fluid. A second aspect of swarms is that uh, users within them have the ability to quickly navigate and migrate across websites. Um, and this aspect of cross-platform posting is something that I would like to emphasize. And then finally, and quite importantly, users within swarms often use coded language as a means to flout law and regulation of their content. They're very adept at navigating policies aimed to stimmy their activity. Now, very importantly, and I think this is obvious, but we often forget this, is that different platforms have different purposes. Research shows that mainstream platforms primarily provide opportunities for amplification and exposure to wide audiences. Whereas on fringe platforms or alt tech platforms, users are already radicalized. And these instances, these platforms provide opportunities for communication and for mobilization in terms of fostering that in-group identity. And here I would like to focus on, excuse the typo, but cross-platform posting, which is quite key towards understanding the success of far-right communities online. Next slide, please. Now, there are blind spots, I argue, when it comes towards tracking cross-platform activity, and in particular, gendered blind spots. So to reiterate, we know that social media and alternative media have opened up new avenues for propaganda, recruitment, radicalization, and importantly, community building. 
But I argue that tech use is highly gendered on different platforms. Research shows that dark web and fringe forums are predominantly used by men. And while everybody uses mainstream platforms, they're primarily dominated by women who will use uh, the affordances of mainstream tech to recruit followers and build audiences for the movement. And often these women are very successful at eluding regulation. I show an example there on the right, uh, taken from the Instagram story of a far right activist. Uh, here she writes, that the Kufer jab could affect female and male fertility. This is all a plan to reduce the population via widespread sterilization. So here she's spreading disinformation about the coronavirus uh, that is then weaponized into far-right ideology concerning fertility and the Great Replacement. And also just note that the term Kufer there comes from the platform 4chan, which referred to somebody who would eat bat soup in Wuhan, China, and Kuf or cough. And since then, it's expanded its usage across different platforms um, to refer to anybody or to refer to the coronavirus more generally. She also writes in the post, Bill Gates is spearheading the push for mandatory vaccination. So here she's also spreading disinformation that is intertwined or tapped into far-right narratives concerning globalists. And I think an important point to mention here is the deliberate misspelling or manipulation of the word vaccination. So during the pandemic, Instagram uh, included a pop-up banner on its posts for a content that would include words such as COVID, coronavirus vaccine, in which uh, users would be redirected to World Health Organization official statistics about the coronavirus and the vaccine. And here we can see how the far right is deliberately finding ways to maneuver or to circumvent regulations of their content. Next slide, please. Another example of the ways in which gender narratives can traverse um, sometimes into offline violence uh, is an example here of Philip Munzhus, who in 2019, after inspired by the Christchurch shooter and the El Paso shooter, murdered his adopted stepsister from China and attempted to carry out an attack at a mosque in Barrow, Norway. Now, in the trial the following year, uh, it was revealed that Munzhus uh, held national socialist racist and misogynistic views, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, but he did reveal during the trial that he, in the weeks leading up to the attack, he became obsessed with watching content on Red Ice TV, which is an alternative media site that's based in the US and Sweden. And in particular, Mons has cited uh, that he wanted to find a wife, have white children, and settle down in the Norwegian countryside after carrying out the attack thereby being um, directly influenced by the type of content that was being put out by Red Ice at the time. And this example showed to me the very dangerous effects that we can sometimes see in the ways that uh, women um, can have a radicalizing effect upon young men uh, in situations such as this. Uh, next slide, please. And though even Red Ice uh, was banned from YouTube in October 2019 for promoting white nationalist views, we can still see that it still remains quite active, both on mainstream and alt tech platforms. An example on the top left are the um, owners of Red Ice TV who appeared on uh, a YouTube channel um, in which the host of the YouTube channel asked, what took out your YouTube channel, Red Ice that is, uh, and to which they reply, we were experiencing massive growth and we had videos that would get a million views towards the end. So we were reaching a lot of people. So the justification is because they were getting more visible and become, becoming more popular, uh, this visibility afforded them uh, enough um, of attention span um, for action. But of course, we also see Red Ice that is still prominent on other platforms such as Twitter, uh, that screenshot you see there on the top right. And indeed, the content that Red Eye sponsors still remains on YouTube. So the photo on the bottom left is from a channel that uh, a food vlogging channel that is sponsored by Red Ice. Um, and as you can see in the video, their logo of Red Ice is there um, on that video. And then uh, perhaps expectedly, Red Ice has then transitioned towards Odyssey as its primary um, Altec platform for releasing content. Next slide, please. What I want to show now are a couple of examples as well of the gender blind spots when it comes to content moderation. 
So the first quote is from 2018 from a far right YouTuber. She says, to be honest though, I don't doubt that I'm soon to be banned. Not because I'm an extremist, but because the establishment considers me and many other people like me to be a threat. I guess it's just too bad though, because they don't have one hope in the entire world of stopping us. Then in 2020, the same YouTuber said, I think it might be a good idea to subscribe to me on alternative platforms at the moment, just because there's wave after wave of censorship. It just keeps coming. You'll never know when I'm, I'll be next. And as of 2022, she has 176,000 subscribers. Next slide, please. Another YouTuber in 2017 said, I'm subjected to the whims of YouTube and I don't expect my channel to be alive for much longer. I pretty much wake up every day to see if it's still there. Then in 2021, she said, I really need to rebrand, but what's the point? Because I'm going to be banned in like four seconds. And she said this in an interview with an extreme right commentator, Black Pigeon Speaks, who has been banned from YouTube, but is still allowed to come onto YouTube channels for collabs. As of 2022, this YouTuber has had 123,000 subscribers. Next slide, please. So if there's one big takeaway of this, I want to focus on posting as a feedback loop between mainstream and alt tech platforms. On the left, we see uh, two Instagram stories. Uh, one that's uh, from an influencer who says, I'm on Getter now, it seems like a genuine Twitter alternative. Follow me over there if you're also using that platform. And then in another post on Instagram, she says, if you enjoy my streams, please follow me on my backup channel on DLive. A band wave may be approaching with a link to her DLive account. Similarly, the photo in the middle is taken from the Instagram post uh, of an influencer at an anti-vax rally. And in the comments, you can see that she found out about the rally through a shared Telegram channel within her community. In many ways, these examples are illustrative of how we can think about, again, the way that far-right actors use these different platforms for different purposes. They're still very prominent on mainstream channels, and they still might use alt tech as backup channels, but it's the ways in which that they're able to draw upon this broader ecosystem amongst their followers. And then finally, the post on the far right uh, is taken from an activist, and there you can see uh, in the link of her Odyssey account description, various ways to support her. So links to her website, to, her, to donating cryptocurrency, her Amazon wish list, her, subscribe, her subscribe star, uh, also different Amazon marketplace links to buy her book. And then finally, the various social media channels uh, that you can follow her, such as Twitter, BitChute, Telegram, Instagram, Odyssey, and her email. So thinking about this feedback loop between mainstream and all tech platforms. Next, please. Finally, I just wanted to focus on aspects of platform governance, since I do think this is quite relevant when we talk about um, cross-platform activity. So my big takeaway here is that platform governance is a form of media governments that's characterized by self-regulation, informal mechanisms, and multi-stakeholder initiatives as a way to shape the behavior of firms. One good way to visualize this is through Robert Gower's platform governance triangle, in which we see the points of state, firm and NGOs, and how these different stakeholders work together to govern or to regulate uh, platforms. So in essence, platforms govern. They shape content rules and governments and civil society apply pressure on platforms to affect their governance approaches. Next slide, please. So then what does this mean in terms of developing tools to counter the far right online? Well, we often think about repressive measures first or hard approaches. These are things like deplatforming, which is permanent, or suspension, which is a temporary period of time. Also things like demonetization, which we often think about with platforms like YouTube, but that can include things like cryptocurrency. Um, so the Instagram post on the left um, shows this activist who's been banned from Coinbase, a digital, um, or rather a cryptocurrency trading portfolio. Then there's things like content moderation, which is often attributed to the post level, and that can take the form of things like removal or simply a warning label that's uh, pasted onto posts. But research has shown that large scale content moderation systems can also generate a lot of false positives too. So the Instagram story on the bottom right there um, actually is a, a banner pop up that refers to information about vaccines. The truth is the original post was this influencer sharing 
her vacuum in her Instagram story and that got tagged um, with vaccination. And then finally, the last two measures, things like manipulated search results and changing algorithmic recommendations are perhaps uh, more relevant to platforms like Google or YouTube. Now, it goes without saying that far-right actors are very well aware and have created content to counter these types of repressive measures that are aimed to stimulate their activity. Next slide, please. I also wanted to show here an example of what could be disproportionate responses when it comes to platforms with the same account user. So you will see two examples here from the same user. Uh, the ones, the photos on the left are from this user's Instagram accounts. And so she's actually banned from showing photos of her husband, Martin Zellner, uh, the leader of the Austrian branch of the identitarian movement uh, on Instagram. So she covers his face with the filters. Uh, but then she shows these exact same photos on her Telegram channel where she is not restricted um, in any means to moderate her content. So thinking about um, the disproportionate responses when it comes then to cross-platform posting and regulation. Next slide, please. And then finally, there are soft approaches that we can consider when it comes to tools to counter the far right online. Uh, perhaps we're most familiar with counter narratives and Moonshot's pioneering of the redirect method, which I won't discuss since Moonshot is here today. But also, I believe, often underutilized that of counter influencers. So these are influencers who might debunk far right myths and ideology online. Benjamin Lee has done a very good study uh, with the UK's counter extremism strategy into what he calls informal content, content messengers. And he emphasizes that when it comes to looking at counter influencers, it's important to look at what is the motivation or the ideology that's driving these counter influencers. What are the very strategies that they employ to get audiences? And then what are the potential risks and pitfalls for including them in government programs? And he emphasizes that the most important thing is providing them credibility and control over the creative process when it comes to their content so that they can still be seen as genuine and authentic by their audiences. So to conclude, next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, the first point I want to emphasize is understanding networks as swarms. That is their decentralized structure, their ability to quickly navigate and migrate across platforms, and their use of coded language to circumvent law and regulation. The second point I would like to emphasize is that different platforms have different purposes, as I hope I showed you today. Mainstream platforms provide opportunities for amplification and for exposure versus alt tech or fringe platforms often serve for communication and mobilization purposes for users who've already been radicalized. And that cross-platform posting enables this continuity and this feedback loop amongst actors and the broader networks that they operate within. And finally, when it comes to blind spots in platform governance, we often overlook the importance of gender dynamics and radicalization, recruitment, and propaganda, as well as in the tools that we've developed to mitigate or to counter the far right. And that sometimes this can take the form of disproportionate responses on different platforms. So thanks very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. A lot of information there, and thank you for all the screenshots. I'm sure everyone learned a lot from that. So our next panelist will be Lydia Kahlo. She is a research fellow in the Transnational Issues Program at the Lowry Institute and manages the Lowry Institute's core partnership with the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. She is a fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute of Deakin University. She is the coordinator of the Avert Network, an Australian-based international research network, and focuses on issues around extremism and terrorism. Lydia began her counterterrorism and national security career in the United States after the September 11th attacks. She is, recognized, she is a recognized expert on terrorism and extremism, having worked for the White House Office of Homeland Security, U.S. Department of Defense, and New York Police Department, Boston Police Department, and the Council on Foreign Relations. Her current research focus centers around the issues of anti-government and far-right violent extremism, technology challenges to democracy, 
national disasters, extremism, political stability. She has a forthcoming book with Penguin due to be published in August called The Rise of the Extreme Right, The New Global Terrorism and Its Threat to Democracy. Everyone make sure you go buy the book. It's going to be really good, I promise. And now we will have uh, Lydia go on with our presentation. Thank you, Lydia. Thanks very much. Am I coming through now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all at the GNET conference, uh, even if I can only join you rem remotely and despite the tech glitches, and to be at consortium through our core partnership at the Lowy Institute. Uh, it's an honor also to be presenting um, on this panel with such accomplished uh, researchers. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. And after. Yes, that's great. Um, so today, like Tim, I'm going to explore the subject of extremist use of alt tech platforms through um, the Australian context. And I'm going to explore it through data collected as part of a research project examining the emergence of far right adjacent anti government and lockdown movement COVID pandemic uh, in Australia. And in this presentation, I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to explore the how and why extremists use alt tech platforms. And the second theme I'll speak to is extremist grievances and concerns around the tech industry, particularly mainstream tech platforms. And I'll also touch upon how the two are interrelated. If you could go to the next slide, please. I'd like to acknowledge first, though, in this presentation that it draws on work from a larger ongoing research project called Crisis Points that's funded by an Australian-based international research consortium called the Centre for Resilient and Inclusive Societies. And this is part of a larger research project that focuses on how disasters and crises can impact violent extremism, how they can act as a push factor toward violent extremism, how crises can also heighten grievances and provide openings for groups with pre-existing grievances to act violently against the state and to challenge government legitimacy. So this project focuses on Australian far-right, anti-government and conspiracy-driven movements, uh, movements and trends that often do and engage during back-to-back -back natural disasters and crisis events in the Australian context with the 2019 bushfires, the ongoing COVID pandemic, and also an ongoing drought. And so the observations that I'm sharing with you today are based on data collected from Telegram channels for this project, but I'll focus here on the use of alt tech platforms by extremist movements that emerge during these crisis events, particularly the COVID crisis. You go on to the next slide, please. So during the pandemic, there was a so-called anti-lockdown movement uh, that developed. They developed around the world and here in, in Australia as well. And it's important to give a bit um, of info on the Australian context. So Australia had some of the most robust and restrictive COVID pandemic measures in the world. It was often euphemistically referred to as Fortress Australia. And that's referring to how Australia closed its borders to much of the world, how it didn't allow its residents to leave without hard to get exemptions for 18 months, and how many states in Australia internally shut down their own state borders and declared states of emergency where people's freedom and assembly were severely curtailed for prolonged periods of time. And the Australian state of Victoria, where I'm currently based, had one of the longest, strictest lockdowns in the world. And so this hardline approach, this hardline Fortress Australia approach, uh, which amounted to some of the strictest public health measures in the democratic world, also fueled conspiratorial narratives about authoritarian government takeover and engendered a lot of grievances. And those grievances coalesced into what became known as the Australian anti-lockdown movement. The anti-lockdown movement emerged during the COVID pandemic, uh, protesting this hardline approach, protesting state of emergency measures, mask mandates, vaccine mandates that were enacted throughout the country. The movement was largely a conspiratorial one. It was anti-government and it intersected with anti-vax and far-right elements. It largely developed as an online phenomenon, at least at first. So the anti-lockdown activists and pages were first started on Facebook and they garnered massive followings in the hundreds of thousands for the most popular pages. But then on after the mainstream forms cracked down against COVID disinformation around mid to late to 2020. And so having been booted off Facebook, the anti-lockdown movement then quickly pivoted to Telegram and started something called the Freedom Rally Telegram channels which were a form for COVID disinformation, vaccine disinformation, and other anti-government disinformation. And it was a form for like-minded individuals who harbored anti-government views and grievances against the government, against these harsh lockdown measures to coalesce. It also became a forum where established sovereign citizen and far-right movements also came to engage. 
the, um, these anti-lockdown channels also became an organizing hub for real world protests, which because of the state of emergency declarations that restricted freedom of assembly, even outside, were actually illegal. And so these protests, while normally a right of a living in a democracy, were illegal at the time and became a form of anti-government action. And they were largely organized through these freedom rally telegram channels. If you can go on to the next slide, please. So for this project, we coded over 3,000 from the Melbourne Freedom Rally Channel um, from about September 2020 to November 2021. And in examining these posts, we sought to find out not just what they were posting on these alt tech platforms, but how they were using them. And like I mentioned, the emergence of these groups was initially coalesced and expanded via Facebook pages and was aided by the use of the mainstream social media platforms and their algorithmic recommendation functions. So a core community developed in these mainstream platforms. And while they certainly lost followers when they were forced to migrate to alt tech platforms like Telegram, they quickly adapted and used Telegram actually much in the same way that they did Facebook. They turned a platform primarily envisioned for messaging into a social networking platform. And so they were posting and monitoring messages on channels, um, using it as a type of news feed. You know, they were commenting on posts as they would on a social media platform. They were posting memes as they would on a social media platform. They were also reposting messages as digital media can be forwarded or shared between Telegram channels. And Telegram also recently added a stream feature in 2021, which is another feature that social media platforms also had. And that live stream um, feature became important during the real world protests that were occurring in, Vic in uh, Australia, particularly in Victoria, and some of which turned violent. If we go to the next slide, please. But moving to an alt tech platform like Telegram also allowed anti-lockdown movement. So they, they not only uh, were able to kind of use the same core functions as a social media platform, they built upon some of the mainstream platform features. So via Telegram, they could also store document files and exchange secure and encrypted communication, something that was not available in Facebook. And the storage file feature in Telegram in particular was leveraged to store and share big files and libraries of multimedia content. And I thought this quote from a, a recent article in the New York Times describing Telegram actually said it quite well. They called it a Swiss army knife of kind of social media. So it had a news feed similar to Facebook or Twitter for sharing uncensored information as well as encrypted messenger service for secret communications. So it was able to do a lot of things. It was a jack of all trades platform. We go to the next slide, please. However, there is one big caveat. One thing that Telegram did not have or does not have is one of the most widely used features of mainstream platforms, which is the recommend recommender function, the algorithmic recommender function, which initially contributed to the growth of these communities. So having inevitably lost followers when they switched platform, the anti-lockdown movement needed to reconstitute themselves and work around this loss of the automated recommendation tool that brought users to their page. So how did they do this? They formed a do-it-yourself recommendation system on Telegram. Because on Telegram you need to know the exact name of the Telegram group to join and there's no recommender, fu recommender functions, you're less likely to kind of accidentally or incidentally encounter other uh, accounts. So to get around this, um, the anti-lockdown accounts have been manually posting and sending lists of like-minded Telegram accounts to join their threads. So the do-it-yourself recommendation system that, that's been devised on Telegram is uh, basically these anti-lockdown channels putting in a post or message on, uh, on their channel, a listing and the, um, and the tag of all of the other channels to follow. And it's worth noting that some of the recommendations on these anti-lockdown channels are not only other lockdown uh, rally accounts, but of far-right figures, sovereign citizen figures, and conspiracy influencers um, and movement pages. So while it wasn't as efficient or powerful as algorithmic recommendation, it did point to the work available to extremist movements on alternative platforms. And so this practice of mutual liking or following has been identified as a practice among social media influencing uh, ecosystems called pods. And so this pod activity is mostly done by mainstream social media influencers who want to increase their visibility on Main Street platforms. So, you know, people doing fashion tutorials or makeup or, you know, food tasting. But it's been recommended, on, uh, replicated, excuse me, on Telegram by movements like the Freedom Rally Telegram channels where they coordinate this reciprocal activity. 
systematically exchanging follows and comments among these uh, among each other and through this pod like activity or this do it yourself recommendation system they're creating an alternative to the recommender function and mitigating some of the effects of being deplatformed from mainstream social media sites next slide please so this do-it-yourself uh, variety of recommendation is obviously not as powerful as algorithmic recommendation in its reach and efficiency, but cura uh, curated recommendations, what they may lose in efficiency, they may gain in credibility. So the do-it-yourself recommendation system, it may even carry more weight precisely because it is low tech. So if essentially it functions like word of mouth recommendations, which survey after survey has consistently found the most effective and trusted means of marketing and recommendation. So the last survey, Nielsen survey, found that 92% of consumers around the world say they trust earned media, such as word of mouth or recommendation from friends and family, above all other types of advertising. And because this recommendation is made via kind of human to human, or at least a, you know, a known uh, entity online, rather than algorithm to human, it could also serve to strengthen interpersonal bonds and community cohesion which we know are key aspects of the strength and longevity of any social movement. And this works well for extremist movements or extremist adjacent movements like the anti-lockdown uh, protests who hold grievances and fears around technology. Next slide, please. So we discussed how the anti-lockdown movement uses Telegram, and I'll talk a little bit about why, besides the very, very obvious why, which is that they got deplatformed by the mainstream platforms. Um, but in addition to that, they use them because, first, the encryption afforded by Telegram is key. It's aided in the recruitment efforts of these movements and in the development, as the Southern Poverty Law Center have pointed out, of a kind of diffuse, lead leaderless digital network that is much harder to infiltrate um, and to disrupt. And second, uh, there's a, like a less, a very low to no risk of being deplatformed, or at least according to how Telegram is currently operating. And third is because they carry a lot of grievances and distrust of mainstream tech platforms from their experiences being deplatformed. And um, instead of use these, using these alt platforms reluctantly, as they may have done, they've actually settled into using them and now they see the benefits of them as a, a safe space for them to operate. Next slide, please. We've also observed um, with the anti-lockdown movement in particular, which intersects with the sovereign citizen and far right movements, they also have concerns and grievances with big tech surveillance, which they believe they can be avoid using Telegram. So tech surveillance were he heightened and commingled with concerns about government surveillance via the pandemic restrictions and measures in Australia. Next slide, please. We saw this uh, merging or melding of grievances and fears and concerns around surveillance from three areas. So from big tech and mainstream platforms, tech surveillance in general, so the use of tech by the state and corporations to surveil average, average citizens, and COVID being used to surveil and control the general population during the pandemic as a public health measure. And it also intersected, especially in these lockdown, uh, anti-lockdown telegram channels with conspiratorial content, so conspiratorial anti-Chinese sentiment and narrative within the anti-lockdown channels, which stated, um, that via lockdowns and vaccine checks, you know, Australia is following the precedent set by China in its COVID response, that it's using COVID as a precedent to create a CCP-like social credit system or a similar panopticon-like technology and surveillance infrastructure as the CCP has, has uh, uh, enacted. Next slide, please. So I'll end here by saying that our analysis of the anti-lockdown channel data found um, a prevalence of conspiracy theory that the vaccine is some form of microchip to ensure control and surveillance, which shouldn't be a surprise. There's a lot of researchers who are looking at various movements around the world who have found similar narratives as well. Um, but we also found that there were tips and strategies avoiding surveillance that were also prominent in the online discussions among these channels on Telegram. So it included tips like using VPNs, and avoiding using social media sites like Facebook or Twitter and search engines like Google, um, instead championing alternative search engines like Bing or DuckDuckGo to you know, do your own research, quote unquote. Um, a recent New York Times piece also reported on this and revealed that the using these alternative search engines actually led users to more disinformation content, that their algorithms did not filter out as much disinformation as well as the Google algorithm.
There was also um, a narrative around that they will be surveyed and censored for speaking the truth, that big tech was complicit in government building a surveillance state. There was also um, a pervasive fear of infiltration and surveillance from both government and tech companies throughout the channel. So, um, you know, the posts that we observed so far around 30% reference made some sort of reference to surveillance, which I thought was quite large. Um, there's all that also included fears of being infiltrated via that channel by police or government agents, surveillance of members um, by police during protests and rallies. Um, and there was also a lot of discussion about particular Australian legislation that was happening at the time, the surveillance legislation amendment, the identify and disrupt bill in 2021, and also discussion of 5G and how other forms of tech surveillance will impact them. And also this fear of infiltration and surveillance led to a lot of infighting and accusations of sabotage um, within the group as well, say when their real world protest numbers were not as high as they thought. And we noted that this discussion of surveillance actually occurred from the very first posts of when the channel was created. So this wasn't something that came along later, but was actually a narrative and a grievance that was there from the beginning. So while we tend to often think about the antipathy of these anti-lockdown groups, uh, what they have, the antipathy they have for government or the state uh, in monitoring their online presence, um, in the Australian context, at least, it's also clear that they have another focus and concerns, antipathy and grievance and concern around the influence of big tech and concerns around tech surveillance. And so I'll leave it at that. I look forward to any questions if there are any. Uh, and thanks for your patience with the tech challenges. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Lydia, for that wonderful presentation. Sorry we had to cut it a little bit short. So now we'll get into the Q&A section now that everyone's had time to think of all their questions. Uh, do you have the microphone? Uh, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Mira Lakam. I re represent the University of Silesia and the University of Milan. And I have two questions to Evian. Uh, First of all, uh, have you ever encountered any cases of using video games uh, by the far right or the glass on my audience? And if yes, how it is being done? And the second question is related to the dark web that you've mentioned. Uh, could you tell us more about how the far right is uh, using the potential of the dark web? Thanks. Great, thank you for those questions. Um, so I will admit that these are not two areas of my expertise, so I don't want to overstep here. When it comes to the far right using video games, I think we also need to exercise caution when we talk about the gamification of terrorism and extremism. I mean, far right actors will exploit these technologies no matter what, and so we should be focusing less on the medium itself as the problem and the potential solution and more on the ways in which they use um, the ways in which that they use these these mediums um, to to foster um, recruitment, radicalization, propaganda opportunities, um, and, I, and I think at, at one point too, as I mentioned with Discord and Twitch, uh, how vital it is to also be looking at gaming adjacent platforms and the chat functions that they can present, um, rather than just perhaps focusing on the gaming industry itself. And then with the dark web question, it, it's really not my area of expertise, so I don't feel that comfortable answering it. Um, I do hope that there's somebody else at the conference who, who's better equipped to answer that. Thank you for your questions. Thanks. Do we have any more questions for our three panelists? Oh, right over here. Thanks for your presentation. My question is, is there, like, you know, talking within the Australian context, do you think, like, you know, there is, like, you know, an interchange or, like, you know, these kind of uh, far-right groups, they have benefited from ISIS's messages to disseminate their ideology or ideas? Because when you presented, like, you know, like, you know, while you're talking, you remind me about the ISIS's messages uh, according to regarding the COVID-19 and um, uh, feeding the, the anti-government ideas and uh, 
uh, something like this. So, is there any any benefit, like you know, from from each other? Um, that answer, that question could go to um, to, to Lydia actually as well. Um, my 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 answer would be: there's no doubt that they would have, uh, not directly, but I think they would have been observant of the extent to which ISIS were successful in using digital technologies to secure their communications, but also digital technologies to promulgate their ideologies. Um, they, it would not have escaped their notice that ISIS were extraordinarily successful at running rings around Western intelligence agencies' efforts, to begin with, not, not ultimately, to, to curtail their activities. And I think they would have seen that there was a capability there for them to be able to use multiple platforms uh, off the shelf um, to, to, to use to, to spread their messages. And also they would have noticed how slowly many social media, mainstream social media companies are, were to take down that messaging. As we saw in Buffalo, that, you know, the, the shooter there had his messaging up for something like 10 or 12 hours on mainstream platforms. So I think they would have learned from that. But I don't, know, I don't have any evidence that they've directly learned from that. But it's an interesting thought, though, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> so I just have a couple of questions for, let's see, I'll start with Lydia. How would the do-it-yourself recommendation be implemented across all social media platforms, and if not, why? Um, well, we certainly see um, that type of activity occurring um, on mainstream social media platforms. As well, I referenced it in the presentation when I spoke about pod activity, uh, where other just kind of normal social media influencers have, have used this practice. But when you use mainstream social media platforms, they do have that recommender function. And so there's not necessarily that same need to do, do it yourself. Um, so they have, they have the reach and amplification of the recommender functions on mainstream social media sites. Thank you for that one. And I'll ask one more question before we'll wrap up for the day. And that question will be, do you think that deplatforming could ever work? And I'll send this one to all of our panelists. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start since I referenced a bit about deplatforming uh, in my presentation. So I think we should be focusing less on the question, does deplatforming work? And more on what are its effects? And I think the short answer is that the research is pretty divided when it comes to the evidence surrounding deplatforming. So we do know that it's quite effective in the short term in the sense of dismantling networks and especially key nodes. But yes, users migrate to other platforms, but my argument uh, within my talk was that they're likely to already be using those platforms anyways. That is the alt tech or the fringe platforms. And as I try to emphasize, different platforms have different purposes. So this is why I do believe that the echo chamber argument is a bit overblown when it comes to the deep platforming discussion. Another aspect is that sometimes it's easier for researchers like myself to actually collect and archive data on all tech platforms, but I think that's largely because sometimes the underlying technology is so bad. Um, so that's why it has become easy to do so. And meanwhile, law enforcement is already tracking these users. Um, and so finally, um, there is actually a very interesting paper um, from Richard Rogers at the University of Amsterdam, um, in which he has tracked um, celebrities that have been kicked off of Twitter and have migrated to Telegram. And in the paper, they actually found that these celebrities decreased their hateful rhetoric, which would seem counterintuitive. But the reason that they attributed to this is because once they migrated to Telegram, there was no antagonism. There was no opposition to which they could rally or troll around. Um, and that was an interesting finding from at least that one study that they did. Um, and then finally, when it comes to deplatforming, I do believe that we should also be considering our focus on victims that have been harmed on these platforms um, if, uh, you know, if let's say that there is harmful activity that is perpetuated by bad faith actors. Um, and so sort of shifting that focus then and thinking about how can we create these platforms to be more inclusive democratic spaces for everybody on them. <laughs>
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much to all of our panelists, <laughs> to all of our panelists for bearing with us today to all of the technology problems. It's very ironic we're doing the technology panel and we're having tech issues. Um, and thank you to our audience, GNET, GIFCT, and our wonderful tech people right over here for all your help today. And thank you for just bearing with us and the wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you.